All right, so um, up until now, we've been uh, talking about photosynthesis, light reactions, the Calvin cycle. In the last recorded lecture, we were examining the uh, intermediates of the uh, Calvin cycle, the enzymes that catalyze different steps in the Calvin cycle, and now we're focusing on um, the regulation of the Calvin cycle mainly by those enzymes. Uh, we mentioned that as a product here, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate um, is a 3-carbon molecule, uh, phosphate molecule that uh, is potentially exported from the chloroplast into the cytosol. And uh, however, if there is not enough uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate entering the regeneration step to um, to produce RUBP or ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate up here, the CO2 acceptor, then that um, that direction will um, or pathway will override export of G3P. So that's one of the regulating uh, factors um, for uh, prioritizing the movement of or the um, the functioning of the Calvin cycle. Uh, we also looked at the outputs. If uh, G3P does get exported to the to the cytosol, that um, or even inside the chloroplast, it can produce starch from from this triose phosphate G3P, or starch can be produced outside in the cytosol. It can be um, exported to the cytosol to produce sucrose, which then gets loaded into phloem. And so we'll be talking about lo phloem loading and the movement of sucrose throughout the plant in another chapter. Um, and there's where we looked at the different possible fates of G3P. Uh, and so we started talking about the regulation of the Calvin cycle with regard to the supply of C CO2 and the formation of G3P to uh, prioritize the, the regeneration of RUBP. Um, the next topic that we started to talk about was in terms of regulating um, the Calvin cycle was uh, factors that respond to light. So the first one we talked about was how in the light reactions that pH gradient across the thylakoid membrane uh, ideally produces a pH of 8 in the stroma which activates these Calvin cycle enzymes um, which also corresponds with a pH of 5 in the lumen because remember um, during the light reactions pH, the hydrogen ions are collecting inside the lumen or being transported into the lumen from the stroma of the chloroplast which is going to create a um, pH gradient to drive ATP synthesis. Um, all right, and so then a pH of say seven uh, suggests that that gradient isn't steep enough for perhaps ATP synthesis, but certainly is not steep enough for um, optimal activation of those enzymes. So the functioning of the light reactions results in a pH in the stroma that activates those enzymes. Um, and the enzymes that we're looking at specifically activated by that uh, pH of eight in the stroma are Rubisco, um, G3P, uh, dehydrogenase and phosphoribulokinase. So now we're at the point where we can um, see what happens with uh, sort of as a result of this pH gradient. So if we kind of do a little diagram briefly here, uh, let's say this is the, the thylakoid membrane. Thylakoid, we're just kind of making this a little bit small here to, to make the point. And as we know, hydrogen ions uh, have been accumulating here in the lumen. So we have an increase in hydrogen ion concentration. And out here in the stroma, we have a drop in hydrogen ion concentration, which is what drives that pH up uh, in the stroma and the pH down below here in the lumen. Now that pH gradient also creates an electrochemical gradient. As we know, that can drive charged ions in one direction or the other, depending on the, the, I, the charge of the ion. So to counteract um, that electrochemical gradient, as hydrogen ions are transported into the lumen, uh, we'll draw this out a little bit more, the magnesium, magnesium is a counter ion that's um, exported back into the stroma. So to, to equal out um, or to neutralize that electrochemical gradient. So all that, that is happening here is a proton motive force um, to drive ATP synthesis. It's just a proton motive force, not an electrochemical gradient that drives that process. So as a result, we have magnesium ions uh, exported or accumulating 
in the stroma. Um, and in combination with carbon dioxide, obviously being uh, diffusing into the stroma from the stomata and are going to be used in the Calvin cycle, some of that carbon dioxide then if we look down here um, at Rubisco, this is a, a um, diagram of the Rubisco enzyme, um, some of those uh, that CO2 can actually bind here to an allosteric site and here's magnesium that's also binding to that site. So these are the reactions that take place. We have an amino group uh, shown here. Carbon dioxide binds to the amino group um, forming a, a carboxyl group or carbamate here. And then magnesium gets added to that to chelate the um, amino group or to, um, to chelate this uh, carboxyl. Uh, and so that activates, helps activate uh, Rubisco. Okay, and so that's happening because of that pH gradient and because magnesium is transported out into the stroma, um, the magnesium is now ac uh, accumulating near the site of Rubisco to activate it. And then an additional activator would be an enzyme associated with Rubisco here called Rubisco activase, which activates Rubisco, obviously, in the name there. Um, it activates Rubisco when this enzyme here, our activase, is phosphorylated by ATP. Remember, this is all happening in the stroma. ATP synthesis is happening in the stroma as well. So some of that ATP that's used in the Calvin, that's, that's made in the light reactions, can be used to help activate, um, can phosphorylate rather, Rubisco activase. And then Rubisco activase will, in, it, in addition to magnesium and, and carbon dioxide, will activate Rubisco. So activation of Rubisco in the stroma is a very key step for regulating the Calvin cycle. All right, so these are some important ways that, um, it, under B here, that describe the activation of Rubisco uh, resulting from the light reactions, um, the accumulation of magnesium in the stroma, uh, CO2 that's in the stroma that um, bind these to these allosteric sites and, and produce a conformational change in this enzyme to make it active, and the binding of Rubisco activase, which is phosphorylated. Um, and so next we're going to be looking at um, light uh, activated or light activation of these and of several enzymes here. All right, so um, this uh, these diagrams here demonstrate um, an iron sulfur uh, compound or protein uh, component here, a protein called thioredoxin, and this has a, a cysteine. Um, uh, component here with a disulfide bond and so in its oxidized form it uh, consists of this disulfide bond and this is how the the um, this iron sulfur protein is is um, in this form in the dark all right now uh, when light when exposed to light of course, we have the light reactions taking place, and as electrons come in from uh, or moving through photosystem one, they are going to uh, reduce ferredoxin. And we've already talked about how ferredoxin, another iron sulfur protein in the stroma, is usually passing that elect those electrons on to NADP plus uh, uh, to produce NADPH to basically reduce NADP plus with the help of ferredox and NADP plus reductase. In this situation, um, some of the ferredoxin that gets reduced can actually be used to reduce thioredoxin. And so we see that disulfide bond broken. So this breaks the disulfide bond into two sulfhydryl bonds. And this is ferredoxin in its reduced form.
and this of course takes place in the light. Now that um, thioredoxin is in the reduced form, we can come over here and see sort of a summary of what we've just talked about here where ferredoxin becomes reduced and then ferredoxin is going to uh, become reoxidized here as it reduces thioredoxin. And so we've just talked about that here. Um, then thioredoxin in its reduced form is going to uh, re then reduce these target enzymes that from their oxidized form to a reduced form. Again, um, breaking these disulfide bonds from their oxidized form to their reduced form. Here, two sulfhydryl bonds. All right. Um, and as a result, thioredoxin is um, going to return to uh, right here, return to its oxidized form when it when it reduces the target enzymes here. Now, the target enzymes that we're looking for here are the things that we've talked about in the Calvin cycle, like three um, phosphoglycerate um, kinase and G3P dehydrogenase and phosphoribulose kinase. Running out of room here. So these are the target enzymes referred to right here. These target enzymes. So, when they are in their active form, they are reduced. They have a disulfide bond that forms when they're in an inactive form, uh, which is oxidized. And again, this would be in the dark, and this would be the form in the light. Now, it's not very well or clearly known how they go back to this oxidized form, um, whether they are oxidized uh, in some way by thioredoxin again, or if it's directly by ferredoxin, or if there's some other intermediate that's involved. So there's uh, not as much known about how they get back to this oxidized form. But they are known to be oxidized in the dark, and therefore inactive. Now the last diagram that we have here um, showing or illustrating uh, regulators for the Calvin cycle um, is a diagram of the chloroplast showing the thylakoids. And this kind of goes back to our uh, supply of CO2 and the synthesis of G3P, prioritizing the synthesis of RUP, so uh, RU, I'm sorry, RUBP. Um, so RUBP regeneration. And this ties in here because um, the if RUBP regeneration declines, then that export of the triose phosphate, that sugar group, G3P, which is the, what we mean by triose phosphate, uh, is going to stop or uh, is going to slow down. The problem is, is that when this triose phosphate group is exported, it um, the phosphate group gets removed, and that phosphate group is needed back in the chloroplast not only for ATP synthesis, um, but also to make. Uh, G3P, uh, which is the result of ATP phosphorylation. So the export of phosphorus by way of exporting that triose phosphate group uh, kind of shuts down. And so that's another way to, to regulate the, R, the um, Calvin cycle is to, again, as the first thing that we mentioned was to regulate RUBP regeneration. So this is just a general diagram to, to reiterate that, that regulatory mechanism. All right, the next question that we're going to be looking at now is um, leads to our next topic, also in Chapter 8, um, which is basically associated with extreme environmental conditions, um, such as specifically when we think of extreme environmental conditions, we might think of a lot of different things, but for example, uh, what happens to the plant um, when, when temperature increases, when we have hot temperatures, uh, and air conditions are dry. And so we're going to expand on this question and how this affects uh, photosynthesis rate um, and some of the reactions that take place in the next video clip.